first thing was, of course, that I, I knew nothing about the um, anthropology and archaeology of it, really. I tried to read something on the ship, but I had to spend a lot of time looking after two little boys uh, who got chicken pox and Valmai got chicken pox and, you know, and they were so with all sorts of problems. But anyway, um, I got a very good welcome at Otago and very rapidly I realised that the job was going to be almost impossible to control because there were two jobs and they should each have been full-time but um, they had to be part-time, half-time you might say, roughly. Um, I inherited Skinner and Freeman's Stage 1, one-year course, which was comprehensive. And that was a great boon because I had to teach social anthropology, archaeology and physical anthropology. I couldn't cope with linguistics. I mean, I had no training at all. Um, so I developed a one-year course which I taught from the March 59 onwards. I arrived in July 58 and that gave me time to settle in in the museum. And the, the, the great boon, as it worked out, was that I shared a, a um, portion of the Moabone store, fenced off, as it were, um, it, to make an office with Skinner. And he used to come in two or three days a week and talk. And his table talk, of course, was wonderful because I learned so much. Oh, you must read such and so and so. You must read Whistler, you know. He was a great um, believer in culture areas and that sort of thing. He'd met Whistler, I think, on leave one time. Um, and he talked also um, very extensively about problems in New Zealand um, ethnology. Or Maori origins, for example. To what extent were Maoris indubitably Polynesian? Was the first settlement of New Zealand um, Polynesian? Was it perhaps Melanesian? There was a theory that there was an, a first, what you could call Melanesian settlement or non-Polynesian settlement, and then the Maori came in later. Well, there'd been a good deal of archaeology in the South Island, actually, before then, way back to von Haast and the study of the Moa and, uh, and Moas and the association of Moa and, and human culture. Um, but what Golson had done in the North Island was to get archaeology really moving um, from 54 onwards. The following year the New Zealand Archaeological Association was established, the Auckland Society was established by the time I arrived, within two weeks, I was at a meeting in Wellington to set up the site recording scheme. And I had to take on being site recorder for Otago and Southland as well as everything else. So I, what I had to do was to get allies and I had to, to get people who were prepared to work with anthropology, as it were, um, and archaeology uh, locally. And so in late 59-60, um, with Les Lockerbie, who is a New Zealander who was in the museum but was in um, education, he'd been a pupil of Skinner's, we, he and I set up the Otago Anthropological Society. And we started to do fieldwork on a more systematic basis. And I developed uh, fieldwork too, but very badly, actually. I, my archaeology was very poor, and not surprisingly, um, not properly published um, for one reason or another. I could go into that in great detail um, and I've, held, I've repaired it to some extent since but uh, I had really had too much to do because what I was trying to do was to create a situation where the university would take anthropology much more seriously, encourage the development of it as a full degree subject within Otago uh, and the museum should have a full-time appointment as a keeper. Because I had charge of all the cultural collections, from the Paleolithic through to modern pottery. It was ridiculous. Um, well, I had some good allies, and this is very important. I mean, I'm not talking about the work on collections or the work I did on displays. 
or within the friends of the museum or the long conversations with Skinner. I mean, I learned and learned and learned all the time. But I realized, and here my political education was extremely important, I realized that if I could get the support within the arts faculty, particularly the, the people who controlled policy, the, uh, the dean of arts, for example, um, and various other people, particularly university people who are on the, the Museum Trust Board, if I could get them uh, to be convinced that we needed to develop uh, the two aspects of the job, um, then the odds were that eventually we would get um, agreement to create two full-time appointments. And that happened. But it didn't happen until the agreement came through in late 61, by which time I'd worked very hard and was very tired, but okay, you know, we got agreement. And from February 62, I became full-time in the university and they promoted me senior lecturer. And a chap called Dave Simmons came down from Auckland and took over the job in the museum. Um, and that gave me the green light ultimately, really, to develop the department. But there was only me. Now, you know, um, I had enormous support. There was Guy Manton, who was Dean of Arts, a classicist. He'd been in John's, but he had taught classics at Sydney um, before the war. And then after the war, he went to Otago as Professor of Classics. And he was very much in favour of anthropology. Um, and he gave me a lot of support. And the chap called Angus Ross, whose stepdaughter I'm meeting tonight, incidentally, because she's a visiting fellow at Clare Hall. Um, and Angus uh, was a historian. He, he was in King's after the war as a Commonwealth fellow or something like that, visiting fellow. And he'd been a student of Skinner's in the 30s. There were a bunch of them who had done anthropology. I think Davin, the, the, the New Zealand novelist, I think, and subsequently in Oxford University Press, I think he had done some anthropology. Angus had done anthropology with Skinner and had a very distinguished war record in the New Zealand division. Um, MC and two bars, Greek VC, I mean, extraordinary man. And he was a tremendous supporter of anthropology and he was on the trust board. He was a reader in history then and he convinced the trust board that we should have two jobs. And of course his mana was enormous. It still is, actually, in retrospect. His stepdaughter told me that uh, he had a tremendous funeral. He died only a year or two ago, in his late 80s. He was a great man, a great man, interesting man. So I went full-time university in early 62. I got an agreement to have one new appointment. And slowly we built up the department. Um, I had a sabbatical in 64-5, so although I did a decade at Otago, I was actually... I had a year away, and I, I ba we based ourselves here. We had four children by then. Yeah, in Cambridge. Yes, in Cambridge. Um, and the, the museum people were very helpful. Geoffrey Bushnell was very helpful. Anita's room mm -hmm. was vacant, so mm -hmm. went there. I went there. Um, I met um, <coughs> I met Edmund. Mm -hmm. I'd never met him before. What, what, what? Can we pause on Edmund a second? Um, Sorry? Can we pause yes. on Edmund? I mean, what's your impression? Was your impression over working? Well, two things. Um, Edmund Leach, that is. Yes, yes. Um, I went to him and said, look, can I come to your, can I sit in on some of your lectures on the history of anthropology? He said, yes, of course. He said, he, he said I've, I've heard about you and you're from Otago, aren't you? And I said, yes. And um, I said, can I come and see you sometime and get some advice? on how to develop the department. I did this systematically. I went to Meyer, um, I, I went to Graham Clark. Uh, well, he comes into the story earlier, actually. I talked to everybody that I possibly could. Um, and Edmund, Edmund gave me very good advice. He said, don't try and teach the whole subject. Get good people who can teach what they're good at, and you'll get the students. If you get good quality teaching in whatever field in anthropology and archaeology, then it'll grow. And he welcomed the fact, as did Graham actually, as did Meyer, 
that it was a department of anthropology which had archaeology within it and some teaching in physical anthropology, although some of that I used to farm out to the people in the medical school and dental school uh, who were interested in anthropology. You know, I was building allies all the time. There was opposition, of course, because there were established departments in science particularly um, who were very ambitious, uh, you know, in mathematics, for instance. So we didn't get a chair agreed until actually the year I left. Um, the reason why I um, developed a policy of having a full-time university department and a full-time museum post was that um, it was essentially a question of um, leadership and power. If you had too close a link between the university and the museum, such as existed in Skinner's time, then there would be a continual division of responsibility that would be blurred that what was important was to have a full-time museum specialist who nonetheless had academic interests and could do some teaching for the department and also encourage the use of museum collections um, on the part of students. And, and that worked. Obviously it worked in various ways um, with various people who would, would be involved. And then, I tried always to build the department by getting New Zealanders. I wanted a New Zealand Department of Anthropology um, and broadly I got that. <coughs> um, although the people didn't necessarily stay. Now I won't go into all the details of that because I think it's unnecessary at this juncture. Um, but what was necessary was to get um, a second year course and then a third year course and then an, um, a master's or BA honours and a master's and so on and so forth. And we got some very good students um, uh, who've gone on and done um, successful jobs elsewhere. I mean, Helen Leach, who was one of my students from, I think, 61, uh, is still at Otago and is a full-time professor um, and has been a visiting fellow at Clare Hall and so on and so forth and was a Rhodes Fellow um, for one year at Oxford, um, a decade ago or so. And I've, I've been very lucky in that respect. And some really good people we had, some of whom have done extremely well in one way or another. And I'm proud of that. But the, once I got the department going, um, and I was doing the politics all the time, and the others were doing the more academic side, which is fine. That was the division of responsibility. And incidentally, Alan, everybody went to all the seminars the senior students and the staff, whatever their discipline, went to all the seminars. So archaeologists could talk to anthropologists and vice versa. And while it isn't so true now, because it's a much bigger department with many more students and so on and so forth, there's still that overall ethos, which I think is tremendously important. And it's true also in Auckland and I would say elsewhere in New Zealand, for obvious reasons. I mean, you can't talk about the history of the Māori without taking into account the contemporary Māori situation and so on. I learned this especially when I was teaching there in January, February this year. And I was teaching of, uh, actually a, um, a course on the archaeology and, and um, on the anthropology of the Pacific with a historical emphasis that included social anthropology and archaeology. So we were flip-flopping from one subject to another as the course developed. Anyway, um, once we would got things moving in that direction, we had to have a chair. We had to have a professor. If we didn't have a professor, the department was being run by a senior lecturer. Eventually I got an associate professorship. Um, but it was vulnerable politically, I always felt. I mean, they treated me as a professor in a sense, but they were getting me on the cheap. Um, and eventually they agreed, the, the, the university agreed to have a chair from 1969, and this was early in 1968, by which time I was, well even earlier, I'd been looking around for a job elsewhere because I'd done my, the work that I went there to do, I felt. Um, I had published very little, I'd done a lot of teaching and so on and so forth. I'd built up the department, but I I hadn't capitalized on it in an academic sense. Um, and uh, <clears throat> by sheer fluke, 
I saw a lectureship in ethnology advertised in the t Times in the Dunedin Public Library in, I think, January 68. At Oxford? Yeah, yes, at Oxford, um, attached to the Pitt Rivers. Not a curatorship, mm. lectureship. Um, it turned out to be Burridge's job, um, Ken Burridge, who I met subsequently and much liked. Um, I'd had, I had broader horizons by that time and I'd met quite a lot of anthropologists and archaeologists from elsewhere because I had a sabbatical, as I said, and Valma and I went to the World um, Anthropological Congress in Moscow in August of 64. And so I'd met quite a lot of Pacific specialists, particularly people based in Europe, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union and so on. So I had quite wide horizons. Um, and you could say I was an ethnologist um, in a sense, in an old-fashioned sense, but at the same time I didn't know where else I could get a job because almost by definition, you know, that sort of specialism was a non-specialism mm -hmm. by that stage. But to my amazement, I applied for the Oxford job as a lecturer. I was an associate professor by that stage. And they appointed me without interview, which amazed me. Um, the curator wrote to me and said, um, we're offering you the job. We can't understand really why you want to be a lecturer here when you're an associate professor at the Targo and you might well become a professor. But I wasn't interested in being a professor. You know, I'd, I'd done my job, I was exhausted, there were problems with the marriage um, in the sense that uh, I, wasn't, I hadn't been able to devote enough time to the family, you know, four children, etc, etc, etc. And I think they didn't want to leave. Well, some of them didn't. Jonathan, the eldest boy, certainly didn't want to leave. And he said that to me several times. And Valma, I felt, was in many ways very happy at Otago. We had lots of friends. It was a very good university, still is. It was small, but you knew people in medicine, in dentistry, in the sciences and so on. You know, people mixed. And that was good for anthropology, very good. Anyway, I got the lectureship uh, and I told the department, I kept it quiet because I didn't want to upset people, you know, get them wondering, because they knew the chair was in the offing, that I was going to leave. And of course, I didn't have any hand in the appointment of the chair afterwards. Hyam, Charles Hyam had come from England as an archaeologist, as a lecturer. I appointed him actually out of the blue without interview. I occasionally was able to do that. Um, and uh, he got the chair over the head of a senior of a, of a senior lecturer, John Harry, who was a social anthropologist, a New Zealander. I thought he was good, John. He'd been a pupil of Raymond in mm, at first, so. yeah. Um, but Hyam got appointed over him and took up the chair in early '69. By which time I was at Pit, the Pitt Rivers. Um, now there's a background to this in that in in 62, Guy Manton, the Dean of Arts, he and I were having a drink on a Friday night in a sort of staff club set up, you know, typical New Zealand Friday evening do. And he said, um, look, we're looking around for a visiting professor, the William Evans Visiting Professorship, which was an, an endowed professorship, the only one they had at the time, a visiting professor. Have you any ideas? And I said, well, what about Graham Clark? And he knew of Graham, he was a widely read classicist. So it went through all the committees and they wrote to Graham. And Graham um, and Molly came out in early 64 for the first term, March, by which time I was back from doing the field work with Jan Pitcairn. Um, and then I, after a term I was coming on sabbatical. And Graham had a, a very good... Um, made a very good impression at Otago. And of course that was his introduction to the Pacific. He went on to Australia. He'd been in touch with Mulvaney and Golson, who Golson had gone, Jack had gone to Canberra in 60. And Graham was very proud of the Pacific, the Pacific distribution, you know, because Shawcross had gone to Auckland and Bellwood had gone to Auckland and then they moved over to Canberra and so on. And here was uh, Hyam in Otago, so there were all these Cambridge links. Incidentally, I wasn't a Cambridge prodigy. I didn't go from Cambridge to the Antipodes, you know. Mm -hmm. They had no influence on me getting there at all, actually. Mm 
Um, but Graham enjoyed himself as visiting professor. And we were in a new department. We'd only really, we got a building for the first time, which I got by stealth, which I won't go into. Um, and we, he had a room and so on and so forth. And he liked that. Yes. Helen Leach still remembers having a session with Graham in Graham's room with the other senior students. There were a handful of them. Graham asking questions mm. about New Zealand archaeology in the Pacific. Asking questions. Mm. Not telling people, but asking. And you can see this reflected in the later editions of, of his uh, book on world archaeology. <coughs> <coughs> anyway, Graham was surprised that I had resigned. He heard about it, you know, subsequently. And that I was going to go to Oxford. Because what Graham had in mind was the possibility of me applying for the curatorship here from New Zealand. Um, uh, he, I remember he wrote to me when I was at Pitt Rivers. Um, sorry, and I said, well, I, I loved it at Oxford. I mean, the teaching was light. There was no undergraduate teaching except the work we did for the School of Geography. There was some teaching in the first year uh, in ethnology, which I did with Audrey Butt. Yes, yeah. mm. um, it was great. And I got a fellowship in Worcester. Mm. You know. I mean, was Harry Pitt there then? Yes. Yes. He was my teacher. Yeah, I liked him. Mm. Um, I, I, I was very sorry to leave Worcester. I, I got it out of the blue. I was called an extraordinary fellow. I mean, that was the title. <laughs> typical, typical <laughs> Oxford. Uh, but uh, um, for various reasons, I decided to apply for the curatorship at Cambridge. Uh, partly because um, uh, Graham, Graham obviously wanted me to do so. Um, I left Oxford with reluctance. There were personal reasons for this as well uh, that I won't go into. Um, I came here in tears, quite honestly. I drove over from Oxford the last day of September in an ancient mini from Oxford. Which is about 68, was it? 70. 70. Mm. And I stayed with my mother at Lake and Heath and drove in here at the beginning of, you know, something like the 1st of October, I think mm. it was. Um, and here was a completely new world. I hardly knew the collections, of course. I'd been over to look at the Cook stuff mm. because I got involved with Adrian Kepler and the work that she was doing on Cook. Mm. I met her in Oxford. She was looking at Cook material in Oxford. And I came over here to look at the Cook stuff, superficially. And there was this stuff on display. And the displays were dreadful. I mean, they just were. You know. It wasn't Geoffrey Bushnell's fault. Mm. There are good reasons for this, but they were just very flat displays in ancient cases, objects with labels. Mm. And I realised there was going to be a real problem with the museum. Geoffrey was marvellous. Geoffrey, I'd met that summer after I was appointed. I came over. Um, there was a party for Berkey. Mm. Um, on his 80th birthday. It wasn't the famous one where they all dressed up. No, that was in 48, I think. Was it? I think so. I saw the photographs of that, and Glenn used to talk about it a bit. I came over and talked with people, and what I realised, of course, was that it really wasn't the faculty's or the museum's fault that the situation was as it was, because what I discovered very soon, I think Geoffrey may have told me this personally, that everybody thought there were going to be a new building. It was going to be on the Cedric Avenue site, um, where Oriental Studies and Classics are. Mm. And the, the, that museum building, uh, classical archaeology, was going to be, as I understood it, um, where the Arkanath Museum was to be. And when I arrived and people said, oh, look, we're not going to move, isn't it a shame? I said, no, it's great because we would be moving away from the centre of Cambridge and what we had to do was to stay in, in Downing Street, whatever the problems. But I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to develop. I had really no idea at that stage. I had to talk to other people and Edmund um, 
Edmund Leach. Uh, Edmund Leach, and also Adrienne Kepler, who was then in Honolulu, and she was in the American tradition of cultural anthropology and archaeology, you know. They both said to me quite independently, um, look, go to the States and talk to people at Harvard, Williams at Harvard, and various other people in this cultural tradition of American university museums where you have archaeology and anthropology together. They've got the same problems. They've got to develop collections into a modern setting. They've got to make them relevant for teaching and research in the contemporary sense. The difference is that British social anthropology at that stage, superficially anyway, and I've always believed this, wasn't interested in museum collections, wasn't interested in history in that sense. Now, I never actually believed that in a total sense. And when I talked to, when I got to know Evans Pritchard at Oxford before I came to Cambridge, I got the impression that he was also interested in history. And I mean, there's stuff from Evans Pritchard in the, in the pit, pit rivers, mm. and there's Andaman Island material here from Radcliffe Brown, and so on and so forth. You know, you can't just turn over history like that vis a vis social anthropology. And when I got to know Edmund, mm. I realized that there too, although Edmund, of course, was anti history in the sense that you don't, you can't just have a conjectural history, you have to have a history that makes sense in relation to archaeology. I think the big point was that social anthropologists in the British tradition didn't see archaeology in the broad sense that we saw it in the Pacific mm. as part of that, the overall discipline in the Skinner ethnology tradition that you could build on, you see, with a, with a contemporary technique. Mm. So you get radiocarbon dates in archaeology that are relevant for the creation of Polynesian history in the broad sense and the ethnography fits into this. And when you deal with social change as an ethnographer, you're really working in the same tradition of arche as archaeologists are looking at social change in the pre-European context. That was my philosophy. And when I came here, I realized that what I had to do here was broadly speaking what I'd done in Otago. I had to, I had to find allies within the faculty board, particularly, and in the old schools. And I had to do it with the same rigour that I tended, tried to adopt as a party member, you know, defining tactical positions in a broader um, philosophical context, strategic context, without being doctrinaire about it. And I think I tried to work like that. But I didn't know in detail how we were going to move until I got to know the assistant curators. Uh, Malcolm McLeod, before he went to the BM, who was very, very good in this respect, um, and also uh, the archaeologist who'd been here with Jeffrey. Oh, it'll come to me. I think. Not, not Pat Carter. No, oh, Pat Carter, yes, um, when Pat came, but also, um, oh dear, isn't this awful? I've forgotten her name for the moment. It'll come, it'll come. She gave me an enormous amount of help and eventually I got her promoted to a senior assistant curator the first time they'd ever been Mary one. Mary Craster? Mary Craster. In, <laughs> sorry, Mary was an enormous help. I mean, she advised me continually on the archaeological side. She knew everybody. She'd been here since 57. She'd worked with Geoffrey, who was very supportive, incidentally. Never interfered. We used to talk occasionally, but Geoffrey wasn't terribly well mm. even then. The breakthrough was when we had curators' meetings and McLeod said, look, there's potential storage at a place called Shorts. And we, came, we went out to Shorts, to the old Shorts factory site, and there we could put collections temporarily, permanently now, of course. Mm -hmm. So we began to get space and we worked out a program. I got... The American advice was helpful here, but it was essentially the assistant curators who worked out the detail. Mary and, and um, Malcolm and then Pat and then of course Debbie, yeah. Debbie Swallow. Yeah. They, um, they worked out the details of how we would reorganize the collections because what we had to do was find out what we had in detail, get storage space to move things around and start rebuilding. 
but we couldn't do any of those things until we had a better idea of overall policy. What sort of museum were we going to try and develop? And how were we going to try and work according to a program? And I talked to Edmund and Edmund said, have a yearly program and get it through the faculty board and get it through the general board. And he said, you can always postpone a program if it's a yearly program for a year. If you don't get the money for that next year, just hold it and then do it the next year. Have a big chart, he said. <laughs> and he was right. He was absolutely right. And that's what we did broadly. It's all in the annual reports, you know, what we did. But it meant that the museum looked a mess um, for a considerable time because bits were shut off and collections were being moved. And we did not redo the displays except for short-term ones. We, we, we didn't make the mistake that many museums do when they're reorganizing. Redo the displays and then do the storage. You never redo the storage. We redid the storage. Um, and then, uh, my, then David uh, Philipson uh, redeveloped the displays. Well, that, my side of this was 11 years, between 70 and 81 by which time I was exhausted and I resigned. Well, you can put it off the record if you like, Peter, but the one bit of my, your life over which, in which we overlapped was that resignation, and it's always puzzled me. I have my theory, and I, I'd love to know whether my theory is right about it. Do you want to say anything more about your resignation? Um, I felt I'd done the job that I came here to do, mm. by which time I was in Darwin, um, I was married to Adrian Kepler and um, I was, the plan was, because she never intended to work in this country, she didn't think she'd ever get a job anyway as a Pacific ethno, uh, Pacific um, ethnomusicologist. Um, my idea was to divide my time between Cambridge and wherever she was, because I, I also had uh, responsibilities to Valmai and also to the children and so on. Um, I have always felt that I should do specific jobs in specific places, you know, and, um, and then move if it was possible. I mean, that's what I did at Otago, I did it at Oxford, although with great reluctance, and I did it here for that reason. I was also exhausted, and I wanted to get involved in college work. And Moses Finley, who was still master of, da of Darwin, encouraged me in that respect. I'd been librarian, I was active in the college, and he asked me if I'd like to be deputy dean. And I started that actually just before I resigned, I think I got a thousand a year or something. And I did deputy dean for a couple of years, and then did four or five years, I think, as dean. Four years, to 87, 83 to 87. I gave the old schools a year's notice. I sent in my resignation um, in uh, September 80, I think it was. I got a, a very surprised and upset letter from Nicol. Mm. He, he obviously was concerned because by that time we, we were getting a lot of support from the old schools. I used to go and talk with Harvey, the Deputy Secretary General, regularly, even before I took issues to the faculty board. Mm. And they, they gave me a lot of support. They wanted to see museums developed university museums in the 70s. What about uh, Rio Fortune? Oh, the, my relations with Rio were fantastic, quite extraordinary, bizarre to say the least. I met him when I was on leave. I deliberately sought him out. And then after he had retired, he left a year early. He had a sabbatical at the end of his time, so to speak. And Maya was obviously anxious that he should go. <laughs> and he went back to New Zealand, he and Eileen. And I saw him when he came back. I saw a bit of him when I was on leave from Otago, you know. And I'd read, of, uh, of course I'd read Sorcerers of Dobu. Mm. And also um, that volume he did on the basis of working in Manus. Mm. Yes. Um, Manus religion, yes. Pardon? Manus, Manus religion. religion, yes. The whole business of Sir Ghost, you know. Yes. That was fascinating. Oh, extraordinary, quite extraordinary. But all he would talk about, no, this isn't quite true, but he was still mesmerized by the memory of Malinowski. And he would talk about this, talk about this. I remember walking up Pembroke Street once with him, and that was, and also in the pickerel on one occasion when we had lunch, you know, it was Malinowski. But he, when he came back from New Zealand, we talked about New Zealand and so on. I thought his stuff was tremendous. Why, why, why was he mesmerized by Malinowski? 
Had he been taught by him? No, he hadn't actually. But he, he of course, was working in the, in the, broadly speaking, you might say, in the tradition of Malinowski. But if you look at Malinowski's um, introduction to sorcerers, mm. you'll see that actually they differ quite considerably in attitude. Uh, Malinowski is very careful in what he actually says. Um, no, I think there was an antagonism there, I which I think Rio hadn't been able to work through. Now, there were all sorts of reasons why Rio wrote as little as he did. He wrote more than people actually often give him credit for. But the great book, of course, was, was the book on Dobu. Yes. Um, and I went back to it recently when I was teaching at Otago this, uh, this January, February, and it's full of ambiguities because you don't quite know how he got his information. Mm. Um, and then there's a whole relationship with Mead that's very interesting and the work in Manus and so on. I remember him telling me once that Margaret had been to stay with he and Eileen. And I was interested that, you know, there was a good relationship. But I remember about once after a faculty board meeting talking to Graham, who incidentally, um, Graham, Clark, yeah. Graham Clark gave me a lot of support, as did um, McBurney as did Maya, actually, although Maya, Maya, yeah, Maya Fortis at one stage said, look, he said, why don't you sell some of the stuff? Then you'll have lots of money for the museum. <laughs> that was Jack's idea, too. At one stage, but Jack gave, gave us a lot of support. Look, we could, Alan, we could never have redeveloped a museum, which present colleagues are now capitalizing on to great effect, if we hadn't had the full support of the faculty board. I had to convince her that money from the museum didn't mean less money from the faculty. Yes. Harvey has stressed that point. Mm -hmm. And they were very careful in the old schools to make sure that that was the case. Mm. How did you get on with Maya Fortes? Very well. You liked him? I liked him very much. Mm. I felt that he was to a degree sidelined. Mm. Um, I, I read the stuff, you see. I read African political systems. When I got to know E.P. a bit in Oxford in the Lamb and Flag, um, I, I, I read this stuff as far as I could and I tried to understand it, but personally I got on very well with mine. You had to convince the faculty here that the development of the museum was necessary in its own terms and also it had great historical significance, that the ethnographic collections were as important, if not more important, than the archaeological, and so on and so forth. Once I got that idea over, I've actually got E.P.'s cushion, uh, Evans Pritchard's cushion in the corner there, So, and he was my PhD uh, field examiner. Um, is there any short thing you could say about uh, Evans Pritchard and Raymond Furr? Those are the two who I went to see Raymond when I was on leave in 64 for his advice on how I should develop the department, and I told him what I was doing, and he said, excellent, <laughs> go on doing it. He had contributed to Skinner's, Skinner's Fest Shrift mm. in 1959. Um, and he was, aw he was aware of what was going on in, in, uh, in New Zealand. He was a good New Zealander, Ray Raymond, you know, his loyalties were very strong. Um, and he was very interested in what I was doing. Um, and he said, look, um, keep good relations with Auckland, which I did. All the Auckland department um, were very, gave, gave me a lot of support. They could have been antagonistic, you know, it could have been a competitive attitude, but they weren't like that at all. Pennington and his colleagues, I remember meeting them in a meeting in Christchurch in 1963. They were very, very helpful, and I kept that going all the time. Bulmer, for example, was enormously supportive. And, of course, Golson had left by then, but the archaeologists in Auckland, um, uh, Shawcross and Bellwood, you know, we're, we, we used to get them down to lecture. And then Roger Green, the American, who's had um, so much influence in archaeology in the Pacific, he was enormously helpful. When we started a third year, Roger was our first external examiner. Mm -hmm. And he was very, very um, appreciative of the standard that we were beginning to develop. E.P., well, I didn't get to know him terribly well. I mean, you went to the Lamb and Flag, though. I went to the Lamb and Flag. I used to go to the social anthropology seminars on the Friday in the uh, institute. I could never understand. Well, eventually I did, but it seemed to be ridiculous to have social anthropology in one place and 
and then the sort of um, pit rivers somewhere else and the archaeologists weren't talking and so on and so forth. Not properly anyway, all in the same faculty. Mm. But there were, why wasn't there undergraduate teaching? I mean, now they've got it, of course. But um, Needham was, it gave me a lot of support. And Needham had some diploma and uh, graduate students who were specialising in, in the Pacific. And he sent them to me for tutorials. So you got on with Rodney, yeah? I got on very well with Rodney. I liked Rodney very much. Mm. Um, you see, I, I was, a, in their view, I was a colonial mm. um, who was interested in anthropology, social anthropology and so on and so forth. And I used to go to the faculty board meetings or whatever it was. And, um, and I, uh, um, also Leinhardt yes. was very helpful. I mean, I, I never had any difficulties whatsoever with the social anthropologists. Mm. E.P. I thought was fascinating. I went to his lectures. I went to the lecture he gave in the two years I was there on Malinowski. Mm. And it was fascinating. Mm. And each of them only lasted 40 minutes. What did he say about Malinowski? I can't remember. He, he, he talked to me about him and he was pretty ambivalent. He was. That's my impression. But at the same time, you know, like so many people talking about Malinowski these days, mm. Malinowski was important because A, B, C, D, but. Yes. <laughs> I mean, and so on and so forth. Well, actually, the buts were very clear, I would have thought. I mean, they must have been clear to Haddon mm. um, for one reason or another. Mm. A little story I remember about E.P. was... There was a meeting. Um, who was the chap at Oxford in, in social anthropology who died uh, quite early? Um, Edward? Ed? Ardner. Ardner. Mm. I liked him. Um, they were trying to fix up meetings for the examiners. And uh, they wanted E.P. to chair it. And there, there was a certain meeting. And E.P. said, oh, perhaps I got this wrong. I can't come then. It was the Eton and Harrow match. <laughs> <laughs> But E.P. personally was very friendly to me. I didn't realise that he knew I was, mm. you know, but he was a shrewd man. Very shrewd man. Very shrewd. But he was a, he was a historian, in a, really, by trading, wasn't he? he did didn't he do history in Exeter or something? Yeah, he did. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. In Exeter College. He got a 2 one. Yeah. <laughs> no, I liked all these people, and I listened to them. You know, I took them seriously. But initially, when I was on the faculty board, I mean, there was Edmund and Maya um, and Jack and Tamby. pardon? Tamby. And Tamby, yes. And, and Graham um, and the, um, uh, and the uh, Paleolithic specialist. Uh, John Coles. And John Coles, of course, and the chap who'd worked in North Africa in, in Saranaic. John. Uh, you know who I mean. Yeah, John Alexander. Oh, John Alexander, no, he was in, from West, he'd worked in West Africa, of course. Um, oh dear, uh, never mind. Um, I liked them personally, and eventually when I felt I could speak up on behalf of the museum, once I had a policy that didn't cut across their domains, you know, if they wanted to argue amongst themselves, well, fair enough. Frankly, I benefited, the museum benefited. If the academic people differed amongst themselves, and from a political, tactical point yes, of view, that was fine. <laughs> I thought a lot of the arguments were trivial and bourgeois. Mm. <laughs> so, let's move on. You, you resigned, you went to Darwin and started presumably to have more time to publish. And um, yeah, to a degree, but actually I wrote quite a lot in the 70s. I, mm. I wrote quite a... I, I began to publish, um, partly on Cook, mm. partly on the history um, of Pacific archaeology, etc. I'd edited uh, with uh, two former Otago students a collection of republished papers of Skinner's, mm. which came out in the 70s, and I wrote the introduction to that. Um, and I, I was beginning to work alongside Ada and Kepler on Cook material. I helped her in uh, the book that she eventually produced, Artificial Curiosities, in 1979. I got very involved in that. I got very involved in the foundation of the Museum Ethnographers Group. I was the first chair of that. Uh, and I began to publish uh, in the 70s in that sort of general historical, anthropological, ethno-historical field, you know. Uh, and of course I was beginning to publish on child. Mm. Uh, the first paper was 1971, but the genesis of that was a lecture that I gave in Prague in 1965. You see, it took a long time sometimes for this stuff to come through. Mm. 
Um, and subsequently, I've actually published quite a lot on child, but not a book. Why are you so interested in him? Um, sorry, um, uh, there has been one book, Child in Australia, which I edited with two Australian colleagues, and I got a paper in that. Why am I interested in child? Well, partly because I was taught by him, partly because he was a very rare bird at that time, um, a Marxist uh, archaeologist, partly because he was Antipodean, that only sort of hit me a little bit later. Um, partly because he, he was so prolific. Uh, I mean, um, two, co two colleagues and I put together a bibliography for the Child Conference in Australia in 1990, and there are 600 items in it. You know, the reviews, for example, don't usually appear in his bibliographies. And there, there have been three good books on Child, very good books. Um, which I've always given acknowledgement to, but I've never finished a book myself, although there have been four versions at various times, you know, starting in the 70s. And now, now I'm, I think I've done 13 papers on child. I mean, there's one in, there's one in um, Danish uh, and also in English, and there's one in Polish, or is it one or two? I've forgotten, but um, no, one. Um, I'm bringing all this stuff together, and I'm going to I'm going to finish it this year. I'm sure of that. Um, uh, it won't be a biography in the conventional sense. It'll be a study. There's no point, mm. and I can't talk about his archaeology in the sort of detail that others have done, because I haven't been a European specialist. But I can talk about the development of his political philosophy, mm. and also of his Marxism. Now, his Marxism is interesting because he. If, eventually wrote in the tradition of a Western Marxist um, with a much broader, uh, almost you might say, anti-Soviet scope. That's putting it a bit too strongly. But it's interesting that although he had good personal relations very often with Russian prehistorians, what happened in history, for example, was never translated into Russian. It was translated into other subjects. Um, and uh, there's a review of his work by a Russian archaeologist, whose name I've forgotten for the moment, who, who is very careful in the way he work, analyzes um, Child's work, you see, because under Stalin, the Russian archaeologists wouldn't accept the concept of the Asiatic mode of production. You probably, you know that. Yeah. Whereas he did, mm. you see. And if you look at his book called History, which he wrote in the Past and Present series, and he was on the editorial board, you'll find there that he stresses the fact that um, there's no th that, that the development of uh, socialism into communism and a classless society is not inevitable. <laughs> you can get chaos. You can get the mutual ruin of the contending classes, to quote from the Communist Manifesto. And that's in, that's in his article. And that's in my paper on, um, on child and history when I gave the child memorial lecture one year. Um, well, briefly, those are the reasons why I'm interested in child. The other thing is, of course, that he had this enormously broad approach to European prehistory. He'd read voluminously. He could understand most European languages. He knew the literature from Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, which was very rare in Western Europe at the time. And also, he had a view of the re relevance of archaeology and prehistory to uh, the development of Western civilization, which wasn't unique. I mean, the dawn of European civilization, the first uh, edition, 19, 1925, um, was not out of the blue. There were other people who had written about the origins of Western civilization, you know, from that perspective. But he had a much better detailed grasp of the, of the literature and also, he kept his material up to date. Now, his direct references to Marx and Engels are very, very few, actually. Very few quotations in um, Piecing Together the Past, the book he wrote on archaeological method. There's something from uh, Marx of 1859, you know, on base and superstructure. Um, but uh, he developed his ideas on the significance of ideology, in, particularly in the, in the 50s when he talked about the sociology of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's the stuff that I like to specialize on. Mm -hmm. Because there you get knowledge treated as the result of archaeological and anthropological activity.
and in his book on social evolution there's a whole chapter on the relevance of ethnography. Mm. He was well read in anthropology and Maya knew that. Mm. They were great friends incidentally. Really? Yeah. Maya told me once, and I quote, I refer to this in my Child and History lecture, I think, um, that uh, Child was one of the very few archaeologists who had a knowledge of social anthropology and social theory. Did you know he reviewed one of Merton's books on social theory? In, uh, in that American and Marxist journal, um, uh, Something in Society? Yes. You know, you know the book, you know the journal I mean. No, it, it's, it's essence, essence society, you know, it's, yes. the word begins with S. Um, we put it into the bibliography, I remember. Um, in fact, he, he read much more widely than Merton, and he, he spent part of 36 and also 39 in the States, so he met all these people. One interesting thing, when I interviewed Jack Goody, yes asked him why he became an anthropologist. Mm. He said one of the main reasons was reading Gordon Child. Yes, when he was a war prisoner yes, of war. That's right. He read what happened in history that's right. after he'd been recaptured. Mm. He mm. told me this yes. in a German POW. That's right. I think I put this into the paper, I'm not sure. Um, so I've got, I've got, leading on from Child, two yeah. last questions, Peter. Right. We've just got seven minutes left. Uh, you sort of answered both of them. One is, mm. of the people you have met in this very exciting and varied life, if you had to put, if you were asked to put any of them into the top league, the immortals, the, the great figures in a discipline who will last, their names and their books will be read in two, three hundred years. Um, it sounds as if you think Child would be there. W was there anyone else who struck you, either personally or intellectually, as, as a, a really great thinker. You mean, in the, you, if they, could, I, could one regard them as historical figures? Yes, uh, yes, yes. yes. Um, well, certainly child, mm. but more on the question of, um, of theories of interpretation and the whole business of sociology of knowledge mm. than anything else. I mean, a lot of the detail is irrelevant, although diffusionism is coming back into favour. But, you know, I regard these movements of... Mm -hmm. of um, of isms. isms, as it were, is essentially bourgeois irrelevancies, to be yes. blunt. I mean, I really do see it that way, because I do see these intellectual issues in terms of dialectics. Mm. Um, child, certainly. Um, you know, some of Edmund's writing, mm. uh, I mean, a lot of it we, you might regard overall as too superficial. His, some of his reviews, for example, in the 50s in Man, but my goodness, he could hit on issues which were enormously important in not only the immediate sense, but in the, in the longer term sense. Um, his writing on Malinowski, I think, whether right or wrong, is enormously stimulating. The, the, the relationship that he posits between, say, Fraser and Malinowski, or the contrast, I think these things have a, an enduring significance beyond the immediate relevance. Um, I think if I'd known Haddon, I would have felt that Haddon, no, but the really great figure, um, I mean, the tragedy was Rivers. Um, I gave quite a lot of, I talked quite a lot about Rivers in this course that I'd given in Otago, and there's a student there who really wants to do psychology and anthropology in that order, and he was just smitten by Rivers. He immediately went to read Sassoon mm. and so on and so forth. And he came to me and said, what can you tell me about Rivers? And when the course finished, he came up to me and said, thank you for introducing me to Rivers. I said, Rivers died in 1922. Rivers was only 58. Mm. Malinowski died at the same age. Mm. Oh, Everyone Rivers. famous died at 56 or 58 as far as I know. Um, I think, no, I mean, if you said only two, Child and Rivers, Rivers because of his enormously broad interests. I mean, Rivers made in, uh, wrote some very intelligent stuff about Easter Island before anyone had done any um, archaeological work there. Mm -hmm. Very perceptive stuff. Mm -hmm. Rivers was all for breaking down this distinction between Melanesia and Polynesia. Mm -hmm. uh, those two, I think... The other question is, you've done so many different things, touched on so many disciplines and problems, 
Do you think there's any connecting thread? Yes. I mean, as they say in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, yes. what is the question behind all this activity? Well, it all goes back to school days, actually. I mean, I remember when I first read Marx, you know, what did I read first? 18th Brumaire? Um, and when I read Hill, um, okay, all sorts of weaknesses, no doubt. But I was always looking for the interconnections. I mean, the fact that, okay, there was a civil war, but there were were individuals with loyalties on each side. So what are the intellectual contradictions? How do they arise? How do you link um, a view of history and a feeling that what you're doing is historically justified, Cromwell, for example, with contemporary political action? Um, and I, I felt this particularly when I came to Cambridge and mixed with a whole range of people on the left, you know, from Labour, Labour Club people to Socialist Club people, to non-political people in Peterhouse, um, to communists and so on. When I went and sat in on a few meetings of the communist historians group, and they influenced me very much, just listening to them. Um, Rodney Hilton, for example, I knew, um, because... What, how did you get on with him? Very well. He helped me with a dig I did for the extramural, a small dig I did for the extramural department uh, down near Evesham, because he lived down there with his second wife. Um, um, Hobsbawm I know slightly, um, and um, uh, and um, the Economist, of course. Um, here, yeah. I, I knew her very slightly, but in a different context. Now the chap in Trinity. Uh, Sen? Uh, yeah. Never mind. Um, oh, I read the People's History of England, Morton's People's mm -hmm. History of England. Um, and okay, it was very selective, I still got the copy, and so on and so forth. But these people tried to take a broad view, and I always felt that this is how you should deal with archaeology and anthropology. And Graham Clark, to a degree, I would put among the greats in this respect, because what Graham, who was to me a Tory radical, would say is that look what archaeology has done. It has in enormously increased the consciousness of human history. Okay, you know, Graham was interested in uh, class society. He wrote much more about class society than anything else. Uh, and he, wouldn't have, he didn't really believe, I'm sure, in the nature of primitive communism and all that sort of stuff, which might be a 19th century, you know, evolutionist uh, figment, a la Engels and so on. But Graham insisted on the crucial point that by the development of a proper humanistic and in broad terms philosophically a scientific technique, archaeology could add to the understanding of human history overall. And this is what I felt very strongly about the Pacific. I was lucky to go to the Pacific when all this was developing. And every time I've gone back to New Zealand, I've been back seven times actually since I left, you know, I'm enormously stimulated by this, and still am. Well, one of the leading practitioners is a, a certain uh, Professor Salmond. So um. We're just ending, ending here, so do you want to say hello to... Oh, Anne. Anne. Oh, yes. I mean, she's, she's influenced me greatly. Um, her whole approach to ethno-history, um, the relationship between the understanding of contemporary Maori society and the antecedents um, of the Māori and the, the contact, the study of the contact uh, between Polynesian um, and European explorers. Of course, I went to that initially um, partly through Adrian Kepler, but also because they were pointing me to Oxford. I didn't realise this until I got there because they thought I would know about Cook. I knew nothing about Cook. <laughs> I knew nothing about Cook collections when I went there. And I discovered they had a collection from the second voyage, you know, which I had to work on with others and put on display for a special exhibition. I think it's the conjunction of history, anthropology and archaeology that's always fascinated me. And in the Pacific, you see, if you're working in ethno-history, then you're working in a cross-disciplinary way.